So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you may be in the time zones. And welcome to the Goose um, OCG series uh, webinar series. And this is the fourth uh, webinar we'll be hosting in the series thus far. Um, this particular webinar is around the uh, Automated Shipborne Aerological Program, or ASAP. And uh, it looks at the upper air uh, profiles that uh, we take place at sea. Um, so before we get started, uh, just two notes. Um, my, oh, a couple of notes. My name is uh, Tammy Morris. I'm from the South African Weather Service in Cape Town. Um, this particular Goose webinar will be recorded and will be made available on the um, website. So should you want to go through it again or send on to anybody else who might be interested but uh, may have missed this, uh, you're welcome to do so. Also, please enter your Q&A, any questions into the Q&A chat as we go. I will monitor this uh, while we're busy with the presentations and then we'll have a, a brief discussion around any questions that come up um, after the webinar. So to begin things off, um, I'm going to introduce our two speakers today. The first is uh, Darren Figurski. He's the Operations Branch Chief at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, and at the National Weather Service Ocean Prediction Center in the, in the US. He's also the chair of the Ships Observation Team, or SOT. Um, and our second speaker is Rudolf Krokheyer, my apologies for pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, he's the EASAP Operational Service Manager at the German Weather Service, or DWD. He's also the chair of the Automated Shipborne Aerological Panel and will present um, the, the bulk of the presentation for us. So I'm gonna hand over to Darren and then to Rudolf and we'll um, discuss further after that in the Q&A session. Thank you. All right, we're going to come off a of mute and uh, the have Darren Fergurski again. Yeah, good day, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. It just takes a second, pull up the presentation and get it into presentation mode for everyone. So we got it. So good day, everybody. And again, I'm Darren Fergurski. Now I'm going to start us off. I'll kick it over to, to Rudolph momentarily. I'm just going to talk really briefly about uh, the ship observations team and all of the things it does. Uh, the work of the SOT consists of the Voluntary Observing Ship Scheme, the Ship of Opportunity Program, and uh, while we're the reason why we're here today primarily is the Automated Shipboard Aerological uh, Program panel uh, that Rudolph chairs. I'm going to talk about the first two and on the things it supports. All three help to support research, climate forecasting, numerical weather prediction, um, safety of life at sea, amongst many other things. And again, I'm going to talk about the first two, I'll leave it to a Rudolph uh, to hit the highlights of the main reason why you're here momentarily. If you want to learn more about uh, voluntary observing ships, uh, there's an outstanding video, which the uh, link is at the bottom of the screen. It's about a 13 minute video, a little bit more than that. You can learn a lot about uh, voluntary observing ships there and to uh, kind of see how people take observations, the importance of observations and the like. Once I finish with my quick presentation, I'll dump that uh, link into the chat so you can pull it up a little bit more easily. Um, the VOS, uh, it can be traced back you know, well over 100 years, actually now over 150 years, um, back to a Brussels conference on uniform system of med observations at sea in 1853. Uh, Safety of Life at Sea conferences in 1914, as well as in 1929, where those latter conferences really looked to develop standard forms of observations, uh, standard logging, standard transmissions, uh, wanting ships to get observations out in, in highly inclement weather and the like. And so during the, those, those years and into today, those ships' meteorological observations are being recognized as essential for the provision of safety-related MET services for ships at sea. And for me as an operational meteor meteorologist and the forecasters at the National Weather Service, those ship observations are gold for situational awareness of weather conditions to improve the watches, the warnings that we issue, and to help uh, understand our changing world and our changing climate. Uh, there's a, a 
IMO Maritime Safety Committee Circular 1293, which promotes the uh, voluntary observing ship scheme. And a couple of reasons why VOS is so important I have on this slide here. This is back from December 2020. Uh, in the upper uh, part of the screen, you see a couple of really strong lows. The one to the right with the yellow circle around it is a hurricane force low that was south of the Aleutians in the Northeast uh, Pacific Ocean. To the lower right, it had 85 knots of wind associated with it in its southwest quadrant. And you can see that in the broader view in the lower left image, uh, the brighter the colors, the faster the wind. And what you see there are the polar orbiting scatterometer data uh, taken from satellite. Note that there are gaps in the polar orbiters. And while we do have satellite to help us understand more about what's going on meteorologically, uh, there are the gaps there and vessels can make a big difference in helping to fill those gaps along with uh, being able to help calibrate the uh, satellite information that we do get. More recently, uh, there was a situation with one developing hurricane force low and another hurricane force low, uh, one to the, the, the former one over the Bering Sea, uh, the latter one getting close to the western coast of the United States, moving up toward the uh, southeast panhandle of Alaska. What was great about this in the right image is that there was uh, good indicators, very good indicators of ship avoidance which means that the observations that we get can not only help improve the forecast, but through those improved forecasts, they can help ships get out of the way. And that's what we want in the warnings that we issue. We want people to be safe. We want people to take the right actions, make the right critical decisions. And it's all the observations that we get from Voss, as well as the other networks that are part of the SOT and beyond, you know, that really help in terms of, of safety, again, understanding our climate, helping to validate the satellite observations that we get and so on. So any observations we get are really, really important. And that includes the Ship of Opportunity program. Since 1980, SOUP has had a primary objective to fulfill the XBT upper ocean data requirements. And about 14,000 of those are launched every year along reference lines. Most of those are shared in real time, some delayed mode, but uh, they get out and they help us understand, you know, the upper levels of our ocean and how that uh, the ocean uh, may be changing or what the conditions are related to temperature, salinity, and, and other things. And it's used really by researchers. It gets into models. And on this example here, you can see uh, many of the lines uh, that are high density, um, some that are frequently taken uh, all across the globe, uh, stretching uh, almost over, uh, really over every continent. And it's a very important network, but it's been really hit hard by uh, the pandemic. And in this example here, going back to July of 2021, so just a few months ago, uh, you can see that many of the lines are red, meaning that it's been a struggle to get observations along these lines for a number of challenges that we've had, uh, certainly over the last 18 months or now a little bit longer. Uh, but the, the soup program and, and the panel um, led as chaired by, by Tammy, who introduced us today. Uh, they're, they're trying to overcome these challenges, trying to get observations in as much as possible uh, to help us with, with monitoring of our oceans and, and our climate. And you know, ship observations, where I talked about Voss a little bit, it is beyond weather, uh, like the soup program, for example. Uh, uh, partial carbon dioxide, thermosalinographs, uh, continuous plankton recorders, biogeochemistry, even work with boundary currents. There's a lot of great information uh, that the Ship of, of Opportunity program uh, provides. Uh, and then both programs, VOSS and SOUP, uh, do a lot with climate monitoring, climate assessments. I've mentioned a little bit about satellites already in the terms of their development, their calibration, their evaluation. And one thing I wanted to mention is that you know, the upper ocean observations are, are really, really important. And one modeler who worked for the Nash, works for the National Weather Service, he's a researcher slash modeler, he told me that compared to sea surface observations, there continue to be a negligible quantity of observations in the upper ocean for about 10 to 25 meters to better quantify coupled ocean atmospheric heat fluxes and their impacts. Things that can really make a big difference to the improvement of numerical weather prediction and our overall, again, understanding of our, of our climate, our oceans, and making sure ships are, are safe out there at sea. The last slide I have is I want to talk about ship coordination just very briefly. Now, ship coordination is, is really important 
because in addition to uh, the ship of ship observations team, which includes ASAP and Voss and Soup, there are a lot of other networks uh, globally that also use ships to either take observations or to get their observations deployed. And we need a really good ship coordination network to help us with that. And our Ocean Ops, WMO IOC Ocean Ops there in Brest has a great technical team. They have great technical coordinators to help make sure that the metadata is received, it, it's stored, it's archived, it's in the right formats, the formats are improved. And we also try to work together to make sure that there aren't too many requests to the same, same ships or the shipping company so people don't get confused. They don't get overwhelmed by you know, multiple requests from different networks. Uh, they, do, they do great work for us. Uh, they're indispensable and we appreciate them every day. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Rudolph. With, again, the primary reason that you're here, the Automated Shipboard Aerological Program or ASAP, Rudolph. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Darren. That was faster than I expected. So I will try to share my screen now. I have to check that. Um, yeah, should be this one. Do you see my first slide? We got you. Yes, thank you, Rudolph. Yes, it's perfect. OK, OK. Sorry. After, uh, Two years, or almost two years of COVID-19, I still feel quite uncomfortable talking to a computer screen, um, but that's the way it is. Uh, so I'm Rudolf Krokauer, uh, a name which is also difficult to pronounce for many Germans, so um, don't mind, Tammy. Um, and I will, uh, as, as I, I don't know how many of you are acquainted with uh, upper air soundings at all and or radio soundings. Therefore, I will try not to be too specific. So um, first, I will give a short introduction into ASAP, then um, describe the equipment we use, uh, a little bit about the data flow, then some examples of the performance, and at the end, um, uh, we'll mention the operation on board. So. Um, just to start, ASAP soundings are the only source of routine upper air data in data sparse ocean regions. So, um, there are around 800 uh, weather balloon stations or radio sound stations on land worldwide, but very few uh, over the oceans. And since uh, almost three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered by the oceans, we have a huge data gap. And um, there are no other comparable data uh, over the oceans, so, uh, uh, data coverage cannot be achieved with drop zones or aircraft, ascents, descents. Um, aircraft ascent and descents are very common and popular uh, uh, close to the airports, but these are also, of course, uh, located on land. So, um, yeah, ASAP soundings or weather balloon soundings uh, are the only source of vertical profiles. The main purpose of ASAP is uh, the enhancement of the weather forecast, the numerical weather prediction. Um, of course, the data can also be used for climatological research or for science, but this is not the main, main purpose. Uh, we have to deliver the data for the forecast, and that means that the data have to be available in due time um, within uh, around two hours after observation. All sounding data are transmitted to the global telecommunication system and are therefore available to all national MED services worldwide for free. Regarding the acronym ASAP, um, that means Automated Shipboard Aerological Program. Personally, I'm rather unhappy with that acronym and I think by the end of this webinar you will understand why. So uh, regarding the global ASAP activities, there are only a few players, I will start uh, from the button. There are some research vessels which occasionally provide soundings um, um, when out at uh, specific campaigns. So these are rather irregular soundings. Uh, beyond this, uh, there is uh, one German research vessel which is very active uh, the whole year because it uh, sail, uh, uh, sails in the polar regions in the Arctic and Antarctic and provides soundings um, 
very regularly. There are two Japanese research vessels also providing regular soundings or more or less regular soundings, uh, mainly in the Pacific. And there's one big global player, which is the European UMEDNET or EASA fleet, which consists of 18 ships in total and uh, concentrates on the North Atlantic. So ASAP is uh, the only program which is mainly based on merchant ships, mainly. So these are container vessels in regular service between Europe and North America. And therefore, this webinar is focused on ASAP um, because this is, these are the ships where I can tell most of. So uh, the equipment, um, what do you need? for us, uh, ASAP station. The main components are first the launcher to start the balloon with the attached radio sound. In the in simple way, uh, you, it, it's just your hands to la launch the balloon and uh, you have a device to inflate the balloon with a lifting gas, but usually you have some technical equipment. Uh, either manual or a container launcher. Second main component is the receiver plus uh, the computer, um, which you need to receive the observational data from the radio sound on board the ship. This is uh, uh, the telemetry data. And because we need the data for the weather forecast, we also need a satellite communication system to transmit the data uh, to the receiving centers uh, on land. If it would be for climatological research or, or science, uh, uh, we wouldn't need a transmitter, but this is uh, one of the main or uh, one of the big components of an operational ASAP station. Regarding the types of launchers, um, there are two main uh, uh, systems or differentiations. Uh, one is the manual launcher, which could be your hands, but usually is a, a, a rather simple device to launch the balloon. And the other one is the uh, container launcher, where everything is uh, installed in the container uh, and the balloon is launched with a, a pneumatic launcher from a pneumatic launcher hatch. The station layout can either be a distributed station, a distributed station, where you have the launcher entry and the the uh, electronic equipment um, separated. For instance, the launcher on deck of uh, somewhere on deck, and the um, electronic equipment uh, on the bridge, uh, wheelhouse, or somewhere else on board. Um, the other possible uh, option is the integrated station where you have everything together in one container. And this is this, this integrated station is actually only possible with a container launcher, which might be a 10 feet container launcher or 20 feet container launcher. And uh, but with a manual launcher, you have to have a distributed station. Um, examples of these stations are here. These are two uh, container launchers. These are installed on board two research vessels. And since these research vessels also sail in polar regions, they prefer to have a container where they can uh, have a heated in environment and a um, yeah, more convenient um, way to launch the balloons. In this case, it's an integrated container, uh, which you can see at the uh, um, Areas on top of the uh, on the roof of the container. That means that the electronic equipment is inside the container. But it could also be that uh, the container just hosts the launcher, which is uh, operated with a pneumatic system, which also means that you need power supply from uh, from from the ship and the electronic equipment on the bridge. Most ships today have manual launchers, since these are easier to maintain and cheaper. But as mentioned, uh, ships going to polar regions rather prefer these containers. These are two examples of uh, manual launchers, which are very easy to operate, do not require any power supply, do not require extensive technical maintenance, just uh, uh, need uh, um, connection to the lifting gas. The electronic equipment is not big. It's just a few components. Uh, here on that photo, you see the 
receiver, the laptop, and the satellite communication transceiver. Uh, today, also the SATCOM transceivers are smaller than this one here uh, on that picture. So um, uh, there's space. Or I would say on, on every ship, there's enough space to, to place this equipment somewhere on the bridge or uh, other rooms. So what else do you need? Of course, uh, lifting gas. Uh, we would like to use hydrogen because it's very cheap and uh, uh, um, um, everywhere available, but this is not possible due to safety reasons. And that means that we use helium. And uh, yeah, the other equipment is just some, some tools and the aerials and so on. So some words about the data flow. I will not go into much details, uh, just to, to show the way from the radio sound to the GTS. Um, the telemetry data, the pressure or height, depends whether the radio sound has a pressure sensor or not. Um, the temperature, the humidity, and wind speed and directions are continuously transmitted by telemetry from the radius onto the ship. Continuously means, um, I, I'm not sure, I think it's, it's in one second intervals. Um, these data are collected on board until either 100 hectopascal is reached, that's about 16 kilometers height, and uh, the maximum height, which means the burst height um, at around maybe 30 hectopascal or the signal is lost. Uh, that means that the data are collected on board until uh, uh, they are ready to be transmitted. The first uh, transmission of 100 hectopascal is uh, um, required to have some, some quick data available because a complete uh, a sounding can last up to two hours or even more. And um, therefore we have these two transmissions. The Profiles are transmitted to the responsible data center, which might be Deutsche Wetterdienst, but also uh, other uh, national med services, and from there uh, forwarded to the GTS. On land, uh, the level of the vertical profiles is, um, I think, two seconds usually. Um, that is not possible at sea because we have a limitation in satellite transmission. We have to uh, keep the, the file sizes as small as possible. And um, therefore, we use either 10 or 20 second level, which ends up with file sizes of uh, around 10 up to 15 kilobyte. Now, coming to the performance, uh, I will show some different um, uh, performance of different years and different type of, of presentation. Um, basically, these are the four global players, which I mentioned in the beginning, the again, starting from below, uh, the German research vessel Polarstern, which sails mainly in the polar regions, and the two Japanese research vessels, and then the big European fleet with 14 container ships, three research vessels, and one hospital ship. You see uh, here, uh, the total soundings 2016, uh, uh, the uh, um, majority of all soundings were provided from the EASAP fleet. And below you see one of the typical ships. Uh, it's a container roll-on, roll-off ship of the Atlantic Container Line, 300 meters long. Uh, the launcher is at 40 meters high, and this is a very active ship. Um, first presentation of the performance of first map is uh, one of uh, 2018, just uh, differentiating between these four players or fleets. Um, and you see that most soundings are actually provided from the EASA fleet in the North Atlantic mainly. There are some soundings outside the North Atlantic uh, from ships uh, 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 on their way to the Antarctic and uh, or, uh, um, or from some research vessels. Um, you see the soundings from the German research ship Polarstern between Arctic and Antarctic, the two Japanese ships mainly operating in the Pacific, and the total rest of five other ships which uh, uh, performed irregular soundings. 
This is another type of presentation. Uh, these are just the EA subsonics in the year 2020. And the different colors represent the different ships and you can see these um, uh, regular services of these ships uh, sailing between Europe and North America. Some soundings are again from the research vessels. Uh, in the upper north, the yellow ones are from a Norwegian research vessel. Um, that looks very good, uh, like a very good coverage of the North Atlantic, but we have to keep in mind that this is the annual performance. So uh, the daily average are just around 10 to 15 uh, soundings, not more. On this map, you see um, the density of the soundings uh, in the North Atlantic. And uh, this uh, shows clearly these uh, main trading lines, three legs, uh, the Northern leg between Denmark and Greenland, the leg around 50 degree North in the, uh, the medium leg and the Southern leg between Europe and the French West Indies. These are the, the profiles or no, the, the, the horizontal lines where we have the most soundings. Now, uh, coming to the operations on board, um, as mentioned, most EASOP ships are merchant container vessels and regular service between Europe and North America. That means uh, that the soundings are performed by the crew beside their nautical tasks. Um, one sounding or the effort for one sounding is around maybe 20 minutes, um, depending whether there are maybe problems or, or uh, uh, special wind conditions, but this is uh, the average, 20 minutes. So the oper operators get a financial compensation for their efforts and uh, therefore ASAP operations are usually very much appreciated on board because that means that uh, they get some extra money and uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, um, so most operators or most crews are, are very cooperative and motivated. The advantage of this uh, um, is that we don't need special weather ships, which would be very expensive, and that these uh, ships are permanently manned without additional costs. Uh, no, it should, no, uh, no additional cost should be there. Um, the disadvantage, and we should not underestimate this, is that we have less skilled operators. That uh, was a, pro a problem, is a problem, and will be a problem. Uh, but that is a compromise we have to make. And um, in most cases, it's, it's, it works very well. But uh, especially when there are crew changes where we are not aware of, uh, it might be that uh, um, the quality is going down. So the usual sounding schedule is two to three soundings per day at high seas, not uh, when sailing uh, in, in coastal areas. And uh, we should also be aware that uh, the routine technical, uh, that, that uh, the effort for uh, the technical maintenance can be quite high because we have to, to uh, maintain the system on board. We have to check the hardware. We have to talk with the operators, whether there are problems or issues we are not aware of. We have to replace uh, uh, um, components, uh, laptops and so on, or aerials or cable connections and so on. And the cost per sounding is around 250 euro or 300 uh, dollar, which is not more than on land, but still uh, uh, quite a lot of money, but uh, it's worth. And um, now the last bullet point, uh, the automated shipboard aerological program. This is not true. It's not automated. It's not automatic. All soundings have to be performed by operators on board the ship. And that is the reason why I'm uh, rather unhappy with that acronym automated because uh, most people think of ASAP soundings as automated uh, or automatic uh, launches. This is not true and this is not possible. I'm in the ASAP business for almost 17 years now, um, but I don't know how that acronym uh, um, was agreed on and, and, and when. Uh, maybe it's uh, because um, uh, of the containers which have a semi-automatic pneumatic device uh, to launch the, the hatch, but actually this is not, this is not an automated launch. 
So this is my last slide. And uh, to demonstrate the operations, I would like to show a video now. This video was made by a passenger sailing on board one of the container ships. You can book a passage from Europe to the US or vice versa. And uh, this is also available on YouTube. There's no sound and I will not comment the video. Okay, thank you for your attention. And I will free my screen now. Thank you very yeah. much, uh, Darren and um, Rudolf. So uh, we're gonna go into the Q&A session now. And um, uh, so please feel free to add your questions in. The first one uh, comes from Bruce Ingleby. Um, he says, thank you, Rudolf. Uh, comment, uh, earlier this year, some of the EASAPs started reporting descent profiles. And in September, ECMWF started assimilating those from the RS-41 SONs, excluding the top levels. Um, are you able to comment around um, descent profiles uh, coming from the, the EASAPs? Um, yes, uh, that's right. We started to um, also provide decent data. I uh, didn't intend to go too much into the details at this webinar. Um, um, we noted that the quality of the decent data is uh, um, uh, from good to bad. And now we are rather um, uh, stop the decent data from the low quality soundings we have to investigate or we have to wait for, for new radio sounds. Um, but basically, yes, uh, we would be able to implement the decent data very soon again, if the quality is uh, as required. Yeah. Okay, and then um, just for the information uh, to the participants, the, the vast video that uh, Darren was uh, discussing on the SOC program is available in the chat and you're welcome to go and have a look at your own um, time period. Um, if there's no other questions, I have got a few uh, for Rudolf. The first of these is if, if um, more research vessels now would like to get involved with the ASAP program or once you've changed the acronym to something that um, maybe doesn't say automated, because I've been on board ships where they put these together and it does take some time. Um, how would you go about getting your vessel um, onto an ASAP list? How would you go about making sure your data is reaching the GTS? Um, would you need a balloon room or could you do this? Um, um, a bit differently using just um, the gas bottles as you've shown with that with the smaller system that's done manually how do how do teams get involved more 
Um, yeah, that's difficult to, to answer because there, there's not one way uh, implementing an ASAP system. It depends whether you uh, want to install it on board a, a merchant ships, uh, a ship or whether on board a research vessel. I think research vessel would be probably easier because they are already involved in uh, observations. And uh, of course, it depends on the ship. Uh, first, first address would be uh, the ship manager. Who owns the ships? Who uh, the ship? Who operated? Is it a, a government ship? It's probably probably yes. Which authority? Then you have to contact the um, the coordinator or the, the uh, superintendent of the ship and agree on uh, uh, how to implement and, and where to place the launcher, whether it's uh, out of the way of the cranes, of the aerials, and so on, whether there is space for the electronic equipment. You don't need much space, but whether it's uh, it should be installed on board the bridge, on board the, the uh, um, computer room, and so on. Uh, so there, there's not one way. But actually, the first contact uh, I suggest would be the responsible person for the management of the ship. Okay. Um, and in terms of, of, there's been a big push recently around environmental stewardship and environmental considerations, given that these ascents are taking so sparsely um, around, if you take into account the global oceans, do you know what the um, environmental impact is of these balloons on the oceans once they've popped or do they disintegrate into the atmosphere? Um, I, I don't have any quantities on the environmental impact, but um, the balloon is, is natural rubber. I think that uh, dissolves, uh, but of course there is a battery inside. And this is a question we are also asked often when we install a station on board a ship, uh, a question from the seamen, what about the environmental impact? There is an environmental impact, we cannot deny that. But um, I think the, the value or the, so the benefit is much more than the damage. But uh, actually, I, I don't have any any figures or quantities. Okay. Yes. Um, and as um, Taeyong is saying into the chat, the sounding data of the oceans are very important. Um, and I think this is true for all of the ocean basins, especially those that are understudied. But he, um, they're pointing out the tropical cyclone circumstances wherever the balloon is launched nearby the tropical cyclones. And he's just wondering if the data can be available in real time instead of for research purposes only. Um, um, the data are more or less uh, available in real time, not, not exactly real time, but they are transmitted within uh, usually two hours uh, because it's for the forecast. And uh, that means the data which are on the GTS are usually almost real time. But we also have to, to uh, keep in mind that ships usually try to avoid cyclones and not go into them. And therefore, the ships with an ASAP station uh, yeah, rather would, would rather escape the cyclones. You're not going to have very many uh, uh, soundings happening near tropical cyclones. I wonder if that's the case for um, land-based stations as well. And maybe this is a bit of a reach in terms of the question. Um, if a cyclone, tropical cyclone passes over a land-based station, would there still, uh, would there be any benefit in um, putting a, a sounding up? Maybe Darren, if you have more idea, we don't get very many tropical cyclones in South Africa, so I'm hard pressed to answer this question completely. <laughs> Well, I can try because early in my career in the National Weather Service, I did upper air soundings uh, for my first uh, almost three years in the Weather Service in a station in Michigan. And then back when I returned to Michigan, did upper air soundings. Also, the, the site I was at in North Carolina, we were in charge of a station uh, west of our office that did soundings. So these the stations over land, uh, they are typically, unless for research purposes, they're typically fixed. They're fixed locations. And uh, the people doing the launches, they'll, they'll tend to release the balloons um, an hour or so before uh, the main synoptic hour, 0Z, 12Z. So usually launch the balloon an hour before that, data goes up, uh, comes back uh, to the computers, gets into the system in time for the 0Z or 12Z model runs. Uh, they'll do them in a, in a cyclone. Uh, they'll do them when the weather's not too bad 
unless there's a, a concern of safety to the people going out and doing them. And gradually the weather service is starting to have more automated systems, but there's still the, the, the definite, the, the large minority over uh, offices have to go out and do them manually. So if conditions are safe, people will go out and they'll get the balloon up. If conditions aren't, then, then they won't. But more likely than not, those soundings aren't missed. Thank you, Darren. Um, Rudolph, just going back to the, the question of vessels willing to participate, and this is a question from Zulfi in the uh, chat. Um, are there any capacity building opportunities for groups that are interested in, in, in uh, getting upper air systems onto their vessels? Uh, do, you, do you have any, do you have any information that you could share um, or any opportunities that would assist? Um, no, not formally, but um, everybody who is interested in ASAP can contact me. Uh, I, I would be happy to, to assist. Um, there's another question here from Bernard. Uh, we didn't mention um, research from Chinese vessels. Are there contacts for a collaboration between Europe, USA and Asia outside of Japan? which was mentioned. Do we, uh, maybe Martin, I know is on the call. Um, is there any uh, outside collaboration or contacts that we could be aware of outside of Japan? Or Rudolf, if you have an answer is, is to that. Is that a us? question to me? No, I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, but, uh, potentially Bernard, if you contact uh, the OCG team, um, Martin uh, Crump, and he's just answered now in the chat, no, not yet. There isn't any uh, contacts, collaboration. Um, but if you stay in touch with the OCG team, they may be able to assist when there is something that comes online in terms of collaborations um, outside of Japan that would be uh, able to do this or able to assist. Um, so Vasily's got a question. Uh, he says, thank you colleagues. What is the potential need for the air profiling at sea and what are fundings and from which sources? So I think um, to uh, just to detail that a bit, um, the potential need for the air profiling, I think Rudolf showed in his, um, in his presentation is the need of understanding the upper atmosphere or the atmosphere above the oceans in terms of weather forecast systems, but what funding and from which sources um, Rudolph, is there any um, additional funding or sources that could be um, made available to, to people trying to look at uh, getting involved from outside of the North Atlantic Ocean, whether it's an EASAP program or onto a merchant or research vessel? Is there not any? To, yeah, no. not, to my, not to my knowledge. Uh, all the European yeah. or the EASAP uh, operations are paid by, the, by UMEDNET and you made it is interested in the North Atlantic soundings, yeah. Okay, so that's an interesting point. Um, one that uh, potentially needs to be taken forward, maybe not particularly by um, EASAP, but by the community in terms of trying to develop. Um, and that was actually one of my questions further along um, in terms of getting more soundings out of the other ocean basins is we need to be able to look at funding sources and, and extend this, this, a similar uh, model that um, EASAP is doing within the North Atlantic is try and develop a similar model in other ocean basins. Um, but this is a far larger question or far larger comment than what this particular um, uh, webinar is discussing, I think. So Darren's also mentioned in the chat now for aircraft observations specifically, not ASAP. You can find more information um, at the WMO and he's given a link in the uh, chat box for anybody who's interested in aircraft observations. Darren, do you wanna to add to that maybe? Just very quickly, yeah. So there are aircraft around the world who participate in the program, similar to the one that I linked there, uh, that will take observations at different levels, observations um, in ascent and descent as the as the aircraft goes, and then in special circumstances with heavy turbulence, uh, icing, and the like. So uh, learning more about that, you can see the link there in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so is there any other questions from anybody else? Feel free to either add into the chat or the Q&A. 
or to raise your hands. Um, if not, we're going to close off in a little bit. Um, I think we've answered quite um, interestingly uh, the, the questions that tend to come up very often. People are keen to get involved but don't know how and um, keen to understand more in terms of environmental impact, but also keen to try and get more observations into the other ocean basins. We've seen really nicely how um, the North Atlantic were coming down into the South Atlantic, but there's great big gaps in particularly in uh, places like the Indian Ocean, further Southern Ocean um, and into the South Pacific from what I could see where uh, further observations would be great um, and would be able to uh, help with uh, weather forecasting in these regions. Um, so if there's no other questions, I don't know if there's any final comments from Darren and from Rudolph. I'll just mention before I, I give the last word to Rudolph and then I guess back to you, Tammy, just thanks everybody for their time and attention. Um, you know, consider um, ASAP if uh, you can promote that, uh, that would be great. Uh, think about its, its value and, and also know that a lot of people out there working hard every day to get those observations for us. Taking an up rare uh, observation out over the open ocean in calm conditions is difficult enough. Know that when the waves start getting bigger and the winds start getting stronger, that becomes even more difficult, but people are out they're doing it all the time and it makes a big difference to our forecast. So thank you again for participating in the webinar. Rudolph, over to you for a couple final words. Yeah, I just want to uh, repeat what I uh, said before. If you are interested uh, to set up an ASAP uh, uh, station on board a ship, uh, please feel free or be, please don't hesitate to contact me. I think I can share some experiences from the last year and maybe provide some good advice. I cannot provide any money, but at least I can provide some help. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Darren and thank you to Rudolf. Thank you to everybody for being here. And with that, no further questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to end off the webinar and we hope you enjoyed it. Um, and please send on to other people. Please get hold of us if you want to know any more information. Thank you very much. <laughs>